Lord, we are very grateful to be here, Father. We're grateful that you have brought us here. And grateful, Lord, for your kindness to us in your day set aside for your worship and praise, which is for our good. And we uh, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Lord, for the blessing of working verse by verse through the book of Romans and all the treasures that we can dig up in your word uh, through a study of this letter together. And uh, thank you already, Lord, for the blessings you've afforded us through an understanding of what we've talked about. And we confess, Lord, we acknowledge our need that um, apart from you, we simply cannot understand. We need our hearts and minds illumined by your spirit. Uh, we need the spirit of God to press those truths upon our heart. Um, even more, Lord, uh, with understanding, we can't apply those truths to ourselves and renew our minds or uh, change our hearts. We need you, Lord, to do that work. And so we pray, Lord, that you would, through your word, um, wash us, uh, inform us, mature us, grow us, uh, cause us, Lord, to be able to, with great confidence, come boldly before your throne of grace to obtain mercy, find grace in time of need, and help us, Lord, as we seek to serve you. And as we're considering these texts in particular and the example of the Apostle Paul, um, we magnify the, the worthiness of our Lord Jesus Christ to serve him in this way. Um, and love that truth, Lord, and desire that that would take root in our hearts and that we would praise and worship him through our own uh, lives of submission, uh, indebted devotion to him. Help us, Lord, as we seek to do that for your glory. And if there's anyone here, Lord, who doesn't know you, I pray for the good of their immortal soul, that you would cause them to be born again, would cleanse them of all their sin, justify them, reconcile them to yourself, and make them an everlasting trophy of your grace. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is Indebted and Devoted. We're in part two, Romans chapter one, verses 13 through 15. So this morning, we are considering once more this final paragraph at the end of Paul's general introduction to the church at Rome. Now, a careful reading of these opening verses reveals to us, as it has, the heart and mind of a man who is indebted and devoted. That's where the title of the sermon comes from. Paul is a man here who is under obligation, and he is singularly focused, singularly devoted to pursuing the work that the Lord has given him to do. In verse 14, Paul says, I am a debtor. I'm indebted. I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I'm ready, eager, determined, resolved to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome also. Necessity, Paul says, has been laid upon me. So as we consider the example of the Apostle Paul, the work of the Apostle Paul, it's no mystery to us what is most important to the Apostle Paul, and that is serving the Lord Jesus Christ, serving his cause, serving his people. He saw the whole of his life, start to finish, so to speak, the whole of his life indebted to Jesus Christ and devoted to his cause. Now, if you're like me, we can often, when we, we think about those truths and we think about how we are to live for him, we are not our own. We are to live wholeheartedly, heart, soul, mind, and strength for him. We come into a worship service on Sunday. We walk out of here ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. We wake up on Monday morning, and <laughs> where has all that zeal gone? <laughs> where has all that fervor gone? Where's that understanding gone, right? We want to lay hold of this example. It is our example. Paul says for us to imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. We are to imitate this example of the Apostle Paul. It should, there should be no question 
absolutely no question about your life. What is vastly, far above, more important to you than anything else? You should see it in the way that you, you should hear it in the way that you talk. You should see it in the way that you live. You should see it in the way that you work, right? We should see that about ourselves. There's nothing more important than Jesus Christ and being devoted to his cause. Paul is such a wonderful example of that. And we've got to remember that we're not preaching here in a sense to magnify uh, ultimately the example of Paul. It is the Lord whom Paul serves that is worthy of that kind of devotion, worthy of that kind of indebtedness, right? We want to have that kind of mindset as we think through these texts together. Now, our text is laid out for us. We began this last week. Our text lays out for us first, Paul's sense of obligation. Paul is a man under obligation. He says in verse 14, I am a debtor. In other words, compelled, constrained by what Jesus Christ had done for him, entrusted with a stewardship, so compelled, constrained by what God has called him to do. He is fueled by his love for the Lord, fueled by his love for the Lord's people. And Paul says himself that I am a slave of Jesus Christ, a called apostle, separated to the gospel of God, obligated, indebted to those to whom he has been sent. The second, we saw the scope of Paul's obligation. He is indebted both to Greeks and to barbaros, barbar barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. In other words, Paul is indebted to all men, everyone in between. All men are equally in need and equally desperate apart from justifying faith in Jesus Christ. And therefore, Paul would say, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But thirdly, we discussed the substance of Paul's obligation to preach the gospel, the gospel of God. Verse three, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the only name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved a treasure deposited with earthen vessels like Paul, like you and I. Fourth, we considered Paul's spirit under obligation, his attitude, if you will. Far from seeing this responsibility as some burdensome, dry, or wearisome duty, Paul was motivated, highly motivated, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and to edify his people. Paul longed to be with these people in Rome, longed to teach God's people to bear fruit among them, and that fruit for the glory of God, for the glory of his Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul then was ready, determined. He was enthusiastic to preach the gospel to those who were in Rome also, full of zeal. So before stating the theme then of this letter, which we'll look at, Lord willing, next week in verses 16 and 17, Paul ends what has been a theologically rich, not only theologically rich, but pastorally warm introduction. He ends it with these words in verse 15. So then, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. As much as is in me, right? as with all my heart, longing to see you, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So we have an understanding then of Paul's mission, don't we? We've caught a glimpse of Paul's heart. Paul is gifted. Paul is motivated. This prayer, this desire to go to Rome is entirely in harmony with his apostolic call. Now think with me. We can see, as Paul did, the great benefit of preaching the gospel at the heart of the Roman Empire. We can see, as Paul did, we have every expectation, as Paul would, that people there are going to be saved, the church is going to be built up, saints are going to be established. It would be a great home base, if you will, for a future work in Spain. Paul had all of these ideas in his mind and his head as he purposed and planned to go to Rome. To go to Rome, God knows is not a selfish desire on the part of the Apostle Paul. This is a selfless desire. Right? Paul's not going to Rome to be a tourist. <laughs> He's not motivated to go for personal gain or for personal fame. Paul's not trying to build a reputation for himself. He's not motivated for his own personal comfort or personal preferences. I like the atmosphere in Rome. I like the people in Rome. I like... He's not doing that. He has no ulterior motive, no private agenda. In fact, this is a very godly 
request with a godly purpose, with good, right, and godly reasons behind it. Paul desires in Rome to preach Christ and him crucified to his people. He desires to labor for the sake of the elect, to do what he has been called, to do what he's been commissioned to do. Now, Paul so far has been serving the Lord faithfully. We see that on the pages of scripture. He fully intends to continue serving the Lord faithfully. There's no ulterior motive here. And listen, this has been no flippant, nor has, been a, has it been a careless or a half-hearted request on the part of the Apostle Paul. This idea of going to Rome, this purpose that he intends of preaching the gospel to those who are in Rome also. This is not a, a careless, half-hearted request. Paul has often made plans to go to Rome. He's prayed for them without ceasing, making mention of them in his prayers, making requests if by any means he may find a way in the will of God to come to them, praying for them without ceasing, pleading with God in prayer. Verse, chapter 15, verse 23, having a great desire these many years to come to you. Now think about Paul's person. Think about Paul's work, what Paul intends to do. There's nothing ungodly about this request, is there? Nothing self-serving. Doesn't James chapter 5, verse 16 say that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? And that's true. That's the word of God. We can claim that promise, can't we? And yet, this prayer, this request of Paul has of yet gone unfulfilled. Someone might think his prayer has gone unanswered. Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So having considered Paul's sense of obligation, his scope of obligation, the substance of Paul's obligation, Paul's zealous, fervent, faithful spirit under obligation, lastly, and extremely important, we see in the example of Paul the necessity of submission under obligation. The necessity of submission. You and I, brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, we are under obligation. We are not our own. You and I must be submitted to the will of God in our obligation to him and to the people of God, to those to whom we are sent, the lost with the gospel. Submitted to his will. Paul's sense of obligation includes a profound sense of submission to the will of God. So now, having established and explained Paul's sense of obligation from verses 14 and 15, having laid the groundwork of Paul's indebtedness, I want to go back now to verse 13 and see Paul's submission in light of that indebtedness, right? From verse 13. I've planned for us to do that under three headings. First, Paul's responsibility. Second, God's sovereignty. And then thirdly, Paul's response. First, consider with me Paul's responsibility. Robert Haldane commented regarding verse 13 that Paul's zeal and Paul's affection for those to whom he wrote were not of recent origin. These people had long been cherished in Paul's heart. Paul's been at this for a long time, wanting to see these dear people. And Paul wants them to know this. He wants to convey this aspect of his love to them. So he says to them in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. I want you to know the love that I have for you. I want you to know the love that God has for you. I've often planned to come to you, but I've been hindered, right? On many occasions, frequently, I intended, that's what the word planned mean, I intended, I purposed to come to you. In chapter 15, verse 23, he has a great desire, this great desire to come to them for many years. This has been going on for a long time. And Paul expressed that same kind of zealous affectionate intention back in verse nine, didn't he? Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Just the love that Paul has for a people, remember that he's not yet met. <laughs> he's met a couple of them. 
but he's not ever been there to be with his church. Paul loves them. We love him whom we've not seen, right? Having loved him whom we've not seen. And if we love him who begot, we love him who is begotten of him, right? There's a a love that Paul has for these people, knowing that they are Christ's people. Verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Now, Paul's responsibility is to preach the gospel. He's a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. Peter has been sent to the circumcised. Paul has been sent to the Gentiles, sent to the nations. He labors to be faithful in the work to which he's been called. Certainly the scope of that work includes this church at Rome at the very center, at the very heart of the Roman Empire. And so Paul sees it then as his responsibility to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome also. And so what does Paul then do? He's been praying, he's been intending, planning, purposing. Does Paul just (laughs) retreat in defeat? and despair, maybe even grumble and complain. The Lord knows I'd like to go to Rome, but I can't go there. (laughs) What does Paul do? Paul adds action to his faith. He knows that this is in accord with the will of God, and he plans. Notice that in verse 13, I often planned, intended to come to you. Now again, these aren't selfish or self-willed plans, remember? These are plans that Paul is making in accord, in harmony with his God-given responsibility. And that's important. Paul is not his own. He's a man under submission. He's a man under obligation. He's in submission to the will of God and in that he's following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't the Lord say the same kinds of things? Listen, John 4, verse 34. My food, the Lord says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. We should follow the Lord's example. (laughs) Our food should be to do the will of him who sent us. As the Father has sent me, what? So send I you. (laughs) John chapter 5, verse 30. I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. John chapter 6, verse 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us great example. And the Apostle Paul here is following the Lord's example. He is going to do the will of the Father, the will of him who sent him. But is planning then, is that the extent of Paul's responsibility? What what can Paul do? His prayer, his request has gone unfulfilled to this point. This is in accord with God's will. Paul knows it. What else can Paul do? Paul should be praying, right? Right? Being in submission to the will of God, then, Paul is praying. Verse 9, without ceasing, he makes mention of them always in his prayers. And, if you think about it, in keeping with the apostolic calling on his life and ministry, he makes request then, verse 10, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Notice Paul's submission, submitted to the will of God. All this to say that in these circumstances, listen, Paul won't make a move until he is certain that it is in the will of God for him to go to Rome. That is critical, critical for us to lay hold of, to apprehend and apply in our own circumstances. Paul won't make a move until he is certain that going to Rome is in God's will. Psalm 127 verse 1 Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. If we're going to take steps, brothers and sisters, it needs to be in the Lord's will and with the Lord's blessing. Otherwise, we're building, we're guarding in vain. I'm going to go here or there and do this and that and make money and build bigger silo. Not without the Lord, you're not. You might as well be putting your extra money in a pocket full of holes. (laughs) The Lord will blow it away. He has the power to do that. Or he may, you may find yourself fat and happy with all that extra money and forget the Lord your God and fall into apostasy. 
There are consequences to our decisions. We are to serve the Lord. We are not our own. We are under obligation. We are to be submitted wholly to the will of God. Paul won't make a move until he is certain that going to Rome is God's will. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So what does Paul do? Paul prays. Now you and I, brothers and sisters, we're commanded to pray. The scriptures encourage us to pray. Think with me. You, we've been given access to the Father through Jesus Christ, and we are to come boldly then before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We pray when we pray in accord with his word. We have every expectation that our heavenly Father hears our prayer. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. Sometimes we can be practical or functional atheists in the way that we avoid prayer or in subconscious ways sometimes neglect to think that God actually hears what we are praying. 1 John chapter 5, look there beginning at verse 14. Now John, John has addressed this letter to those in verse 13 who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's addressing this letter to those who believe in Jesus Christ. And he's written this letter that you may know that you have eternal life. Now there's a connection between that and verse 14. If you have this assurance of faith, right, this assurance of eternal life through Jesus Christ, with that sense of assurance comes a blessed confidence in the Lord. When you know that you are his and he is mine, there's a confidence, isn't there? There's a confidence that comes with that assurance our heavenly father, that when we pray to him, the confidence is that when we pray to him for the things that we need to live for him, we have every confidence that he hears us. He hears me when I pray. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, if our earthly fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more, right? Lesser to the greater. This is from deplorably lesser, to infinitely greater, <laughs> how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Lord will show up with grace and mercy and help and supply and strength. Do you see? Verse 14, this, this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now notice first with me, the confidence of our prayer, the confidence of our prayer. The confidence is not a blind faith. It's not a, a presumptuous faith. It is the confidence of a loved child who presents his requests to a loving heavenly father, right? Earthly fathers, good by worldly standards, good earthly fathers. How do they respond when their children come to them with an earnest request, a need, right? How much more will our heavenly father respond to us who are not only his adopted sons and daughters, but we're coming to him in union with his own son, Jesus Christ, how much more, brothers and sisters, we should have confidence when we pray. We've been given access to God as Father through our union with Jesus Christ, his Son. So now we can come boldly before the throne of grace. That word boldly, same word, parasia. Same word as confidence. We can come boldly with confidence before the throne of grace. He sits on a throne, but it is a throne of grace. <laughs> We may come for the very purpose. We should come. We are expected to come for the very purpose of obtaining mercy and finding grace to help. In other words, we're not to pray with doubting, fear, suspicion. When you and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, through our union with Jesus Christ, we honor God when we pray with confidence. 
It is honoring to the Lord for one of his own through Jesus Christ the Son to come to God the Father and say, Lord, you know my need. You are my heavenly Father. I come to you for mercy. I come to you for help. That is honoring to the Lord, to come to the Lord with that kind of confidence. Don't go doubting and weak and suspicious or fearful. We should have every confidence in him. And that confidence is fueled by the fact that we know he hears us. He hears us. Notice next then the rule of our prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, that is the rule that we should come to our prayer with. In other words, there are limitations on our prayer, aren't there? There are limits. There should be a limit set on our prayer. We are only to ask for that which is according to his will. So then, his revealed will, that's the will that we know, right? Do you understand? That's the will that we know. His revealed will, the will that we know is the will, the will that he has revealed to us. Those things that are hidden are for him to know. Those things that are revealed are for us and our children forever. We pray in accord with his revealed will. His revealed will should inform and should guide our prayers. And we can and we should ask for every promise that he has made to us in it, right? God has made promises to us. And we should pray that the Lord would grant those promises to us. In other words, I have no warrant. I have no authority from the word of God to go to God and to pray for selfish or self-serving, self-absorbed things. I have no warrant, no authority to do that. I'm to pray according to his will. So not only should our actions then be in submission to the will of God, but our prayers should be in submission to the will of God, in submission to his service, to be in submission to his glory, his cause, his purposes, his people, right? 19th century Scottish pastor Robert Candlish said this. We pray in this way, right? First John, according to first John 5, 14, when we pray in this way, it is asking upon the ground of a very close union and through identity between God and us in his son. Now think with me. It's on the ground of a, of a close, intimate union and through identity, our identity between God and us in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our asking as one in interest, as one in sympathy, as one in character, as one in end, as one in aim, as one in life or manner of living with him whom we ask. That's what it means to pray according to the will of God. Did you get that? Our asking as though we were one with Jesus Christ in our interest, one with Jesus Christ in our sympathies, as one with Jesus Christ in our character, one in end, one in aim, one in purposes, as one in life or manner of living with him whom we ask. We do that. 1 John 5 verse 15 says, we know we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Notice last, our faith in prayer. Our confidence in prayer, the rule of our prayer, faith in prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Statement of fact, verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, and we do, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That's a faith-filled statement there on the part of the apostle John. Now, that's not always in the manner nor at the time that we may ask, ask or expect. But is that any different from what we see right here in Romans chapter 1 in the example, in the circumstances of the apostle Paul? And Paul is an apostle, and I am not. <laughs> right? That it doesn't negate the truth of that promise. It doesn't negate the truth of that promise. 
And what we'll see from our text is that brothers and sisters often, um, all the time, that's for our good, even though we may not understand it. We'll get there, right? This is an example of our, how our good heavenly father relates to us when we pray, when we pray. Back in Romans 1, what do we find Paul doing then? Well, Paul is doing what he should be doing. Paul is praying. Paul is praying. We must be a people of prayer. If we expect that anything is going to be done through us for his glory, through the, the ministry of this church, the ministry of these dear people, we must pray, must rely on God in prayer. What is Paul's responsibility as a man in submission, as a man under obligation, waiting upon the will of God? What is Paul's responsibility? To pray, to pray. This prayer of Paul, however, of date, has gone unfulfilled. So lastly, what else do we find the Apostle, of Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, what else do we find him doing? We find him obeying, <laughs> obeying. Submitting to the will of God and waiting on the Lord. In other words, the Apostle Paul doesn't get anxious. Paul doesn't start to sweat. He doesn't uh, worry, get anxious like Saul who waited for Samuel to come. And when Samuel delayed, what did Saul do? Saul took matters into his own hands and Saul had the kingdom torn away from him. Why? Because he didn't wait on the Lord. He didn't wait on the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. What the Lord told Saul. Do you see? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And obedience sometimes involves waiting. Obedience involves patience. Obedience involves humbling yourself and waiting upon the Lord like you know that he has heard you <laughs> and that he is sovereign over all your circumstances and is directing your steps, right? It's faith. Paul didn't grumble. Paul didn't complain like Israel in the wilderness. I mean, God brought me out here into Asia Minor to a hopeless and fruitless mission. I'll never see anybody saved and I'll never make it to Rome. God might as well kill me out here in this wilderness. Right? He wasn't like a grumbling Israelite. He didn't sit complaining in his tent. Paul had faith in the Lord. He didn't become fatalistic like Eli. When the Lord intended to judge Eli, what did Eli say? Well, let God do whatever seems right to him. What an awful attitude. Eli, gird up your loins like a man. Stand up, repent of your sins, and go deal with your sons. Let God do whatever seems right to him. Right? What a terrible attitude. He doesn't come confidently and boldly before the Lord in prayer. He yeah, dismisses God. Your faith-filled obedience should be expressed in patient waiting upon the Lord while you continue to pray and obey, <laughs> right? Pray and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. <laughs> this is Paul's responsibility, do you see? This is our responsibility. If we are under obligation, if we're submitted to the will of God, then this is our responsibility. Notice next then, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. There's a passing reference to God's sovereign control over all things found in Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. Do you see it there? sort of in the white spaces between the lines, so to speak. The verb there is passive. Passive was hindered through no action of his own. Paul was prevented from coming. That's what the word means. He was forbidden to come. Paul made every effort to go, didn't he? He made plans to go. He intended to go. He had a great desire to go. He fervently and unceasingly prayed for an opportunity to go. But as of yet, he has been prevented, hindered from going. 
The inference here, and that's observable in the passive tense of that verb, it is Paul, Paul has been prevented from going ultimately by God. Now that's further understood from the fact that who does Paul pray to that he might go? He prays to God. Who does he make request of that he might find a way in his will to go? He prays to God, right? Paul sees God as entirely sovereign over these circumstances. Paul knows it to be true. And God has executed his divine providence through secondary causes in verse 13. Now think with me. Circumstances that Paul refers to as hindering him. God is executing his decrees through providence, executing his divine providence through secondary causes. Those secondary causes mentioned in verse 13 are Paul's circumstances that are hindering him. Do you see that connection, how that works in the plan of God, right? Circumstances that are hindering Paul. I've often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. These hindrances are the secondary causes that God sovereignly uses to direct Paul, his faithful servant, according to his will. Now, do you believe that? In your own life, it works the same way. In my life, it works the same way. Here's a point to consider, okay? God, if God, who works all things after the counsel of his own will, is entirely sovereign over your circumstances, which he is, and he uses the secondary causes of your circumstances to direct you according to his perfect will, which is always for your good, then how do you think you and I should think about those things that hinder us. <laughs> How should we think about hindrances in our Christian experience? We need to learn to appreciate our hindrances. We need to learn to be grateful for our hindrances. God promises to work all things together for our good having delivered up his own son for us all, how much more will he freely give us all things? We should trust that promise. God is in control of our circumstances. We should be grateful for our hindrances. But we can tell from the passage that to this point, all of Paul's prayers to go to Rome have been answered with hindrances. <laughs> That's easy to think that, wow, well, God's not answering my prayer. God's not answering my prayer. God's not answering my prayer. God is answering your prayer. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's been redeemed by God. With the Spirit of God working in him, Paul now makes plans. Paul now thinks. Paul now purposes. He insists, he takes care that his plans, his purposes are all in accord with the will of God. Right? And would a trip to Spain be in accord with the will of God and the calling of God on Paul's life for ministry to the Gentiles. Well, of course it would. And we have the liberty to do that. We're about to plant, Lord willing, if the Lord allows, a church in Dahabon. We have the liberty to think to ourselves, we are employed in the cause of Jesus Christ. Where can we go and preach the gospel that people might be saved? Where is there a need? And as we think and as we pray and as we obey... What does God do? God directs our steps. And how does he do it? He does it through secondary causes. He does it through our circumstances. And as time goes by, we see more clearly in the will of God that it would be right for us to plant a church in Dahabon. Do you see? Right? So that's how God is leading and guiding Paul right now. Maybe you're here this morning and your regular job isn't providing enough for you or for your family. Maybe it's not providing in the way that you would want it to. Right? You're sincerely grateful to God for that job. You're sincerely grateful. Your motives aren't self-serving. You're not sitting back grumbling and complaining. But in keeping with God's directive command that you must provide for your family or provide for yourself, you begin to pray in accord with his will then, right? Right? for work that would better support and care for those entrusted to you or better support and care for yourself. 
That's a prayer entirely in accord, consistent with the will of God for you. And if we pray according to his will, what happens? He hears us, okay? So you know that God hears you. You have that promise in 1 John chapter. Sit back, relax. God wants to give me a job. It's going to show up in my mailbox, right? And I'm a little upset. It's taking so long, so I'm going to wallow in self-pity. <laughs> Woe is me. No, right? No, you do what Paul does. You plan, you pray, and you obey. <laughs> Planning, praying, obeying. How should I be living for the Lord right now during this time as the Lord delays? How should I be living for the Lord right now? What can I be doing for him in my circumstances right now? You don't know what the Lord is doing. It may be that you're there to witness to somebody else. Your last day on the job unbeknownst to you. Somebody walks in the door, you preach the gospel to them, that person gets converted. He's here with you in the church 15 years later. Right? You know, we don't know what the Lord is going to do. Plan, pray, obey. And if there is delay, God has better plans. God has better plans. Maybe he plans to grow your faith, which is more precious than gold, which perishes. Maybe he plans to sanctify you from your complaining. <laughs> Separate you from your matters into your own hands like Saul violate clear biblical wisdom by abandoning your responsibilities to him, abandoning your responsibilities to the church, abandoning your responsibilities to his people, abandoning your responsibilities to preach the gospel here. But listen, it's a great job. <laughs> Just became available in Providence, Rhode Island. How much of a, a clearer sign could you get than that? It's exactly what I need. It's almost of the dollar what I was praying for. <laughs> they need an answer in a week, though. I'm sure I can find a good church there. I'm sure, I'm sure there are solid biblical churches in Rhode Island. <laughs> God may be testing your faith. Do you see? And he may use the consequences of a very bad decision to chasten his self-willed son or daughter. So, Paul, or God, uses Paul's work. Secondly, God also uses sickness or suffering or affliction to direct his people, to direct specifically Paul. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, a few pages to the right. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And listen here to the very same language used by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Paul had intended to go to Corinth, and Paul was hindered. Now, when Paul intended to go to Corinth and said that he was planning to come to Corinth, and he was hindered from going to Corinth, false teachers in Corinth seized on that and called, accused Paul of not being a man of his word, accused Paul of being fickle, right? His yes wasn't his yes. His no wasn't his no. So Paul opens 2 Corinthians chapter 1 here, verse 8, with an explanation. Verse 8, same language. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Do you see that? For our trouble which came to us in Asia. What was that trouble? That we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now that, brothers and sisters, is a severe affliction. He thought he was going to die. Okay. Yes, verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we, so that, here was the Lord's purpose in it, we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Those lessons are hard learned and graciously remembered, right? Verse 10, that God who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Paul says we have a, we have a clear conscience before God. We conducted ourselves in simplicity and in godly sincerity. Look at verse 15. And in this confidence... Here it is again. I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. 
to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, he was planning it. Do you see? Did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? All this comes together, doesn't it? Do you see? Like, there's no self-willed planning on the part of the Apostle Paul. Was I doing my planning according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. We weren't flip-flopping or fickle. No, verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. There were times that Satan hindered Paul. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's just before 2 Thessalonians. 1 <laughs> Thessalonians chapter 2. And look there beginning at verse 17. Sometimes there were times in which uh, Satan hindered the apostle Paul. Verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. He, Paul loved people but loved God's people, right? Just loved God's people. Therefore, verse 18, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You are our glory and joy. The word for hindered here, Satan hindered us at the end of verse 18, is a different word. Enkopto is the word. The NIV probably comes the closest, um, translating this with Satan blocked our way. Satan blocked our way. Lloyd-Jones, um, referring back to sort of the, the semantic intent of this word, uh, said that Satan dug a trench to prevent Paul. Dug a trench. In trench warfare, if you've ever seen pictures of that, troops will dig trenches in order to prevent the enemy from advancing. Enemy tanks fall into a trench. Uh, trenches are good spots from which to defend ground. So digging trenches prevents an enemy from advancing. And that's the meaning of the word here. It's a military term. Satan dug a trench to hinder Paul from coming to them, to cause Paul to fa fall into a trench that Satan had dug for him. You can see Satan's activities being like this, right? Seeking to undermine the work of God's people. We don't battle war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? And here's an example of that. We see the work of Satan, don't we, in the book of Job. With Job, God, sovereign over even Satan, allows Satan to test and afflict righteous Job. So sometimes Satan hinders Paul. Sometimes Satan hinders the work of God's people. Satan is the great adversary. But sometimes, and this is interesting, sometimes the Spirit of God hindered Paul. Look back at Acts, Acts chapter 16. Sometimes the Spirit of God hindered Paul. Acts chapter 16, and look there at verse 6. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried, they tried, periazo is the word. They tried, they put to the test is what that word means, right? They put to the test to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Now, Paul had obviously planned to preach the gospel in Asia um, and was forbidden by the Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So Paul then tested. He put to the test, periazo. He, Paul has the liberty, right? So he will put it to the test and see where God allows progress to be made, right? So 
To use a practical example for our church, there was uh, years ago speaking about the church plant in Dahabon, where we, we were considering a work on the border in Haiti. And so what did we do? We just sat back and waited for a sign from heaven. To... No, we planned, we prayed, and we obeyed. We planned our steps, and we began to move that direction. We, perazzo, we put it to the test, so to speak. And what happened? Not a good place to plant a church. Well, look at that. Wanamith is on the border with Dominican Republic, and just across the border is Dahabon. So let's put it to the test, right? Let's pay radzo. So what do we do? We planned, we prayed, we obeyed, and behold, the Lord directed our steps and has been moving us along very evidently for some time now. We're grateful to the Lord for how he directs our steps. Do you see? So important to understand how this works. All this is happening, Paul says in Acts chapter 16, according to the Spirit, through Paul's circumstances. The Spirit is the one forbidding or preventing, hindering, and it's through Paul's spirit circumstances. So what does Paul do? He puts it to the test in Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit him. So verse 8, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. They wanted to go to Asia. The Spirit prevented them. They wanted to go to Mysia. The Spirit prevented them. They wanted to go to Bithynia. The Spirit did not permit them. Passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, again, Paul is an apostle directed immediately by God, not immediately, but immediately by God to take the word of God to the people of God. We don't have modern day apostles, mind you. And so, God communicates to Paul through a vision, a man from Macedonia, and what does Paul conclude? The Lord has called us to preach the gospel to them. So what does Paul do? He goes to Macedonia. What does he not do? He doesn't get on a boat like, like Jonah and go somewhere else. I really didn't want to go there. Now, that didn't end well for Jonah. Paul goes to Macedonia. So Paul understands then the revealed will of God. And then Paul acts with confidence according to that revealed will, trusting God and then discerning the will of God as he goes. And there was a great work of God in Macedonia, a great work of God in Macedonia. We must know and be submissive to, subject to the revealed will of God if we expect to faithfully discern and follow the guidance of God that he gives us through his providence. I want to say that again. We must know and be subject to the revealed will of God if we expect to faithfully discern and follow the guidance of God given to us through his providence. For that, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Hang in there with me now. Romans chapter 12. It's an example of this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you there. I plead with you. I plead with you, brothers sisters, by the mercies of God that you present your living, breathing, walking, talking bodies, a living sacrifice, holy. That sacrifice is to be wholly consumed on the altar, right? Wholly consumed. It's not, not that you present a part or a piece. Heart, will, mind, and strength. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable latreia, worship. It's your reasonable worship. Reasonable. It's not extravagant. It's reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how does that happen? It happens as we grow in our understanding of the revealed word of God, right? The more we know his word, the more that we are renewed in our mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that 
with the purpose that you may prove, dakimadzo, you may test or examine. Back to that idea of testing, right? That Paul in Acts chapter 16. That you may test or examine, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need God to uphold us at all times, right? To uh, give us understanding, to protect us. But the less I know and understand his word, the less I am renewed in my mind and the less I then am able to prove, test, or examine what is his good and acceptable and perfect will. You see, discerning God's will, submitting to God's will, following God requires that we, have, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So you and I have to study his revealed will, the Bible, so that we can discern his will. <laughs> we, we have to understand his word. And what do you see all over the place? It's, it's, it's absurd. People attempting to discern his will in all kinds of ways and places, and they don't know anything about his word. Don't know the Bible, right? Feelings, experiences, all those things. And yet the one place where I am told to go yeah. It's right, and so don't do it. <laughs> you know? That's how fleshly we are, how stupid we are. We considered Paul's responsibility. We considered God's sovereignty. Well, what was Paul's response then? What was Paul's response? What did Paul do in the light of God's sovereign direction in his life? What did Paul do? When his good and when his good and godly requests were not being fulfilled, what did Paul do? He planned, he prayed, he obeyed. And he didn't stop. He didn't stop. There's an example in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 13, of King Joash and Elisha, right? Elisha comes to King Joash and says, King, take arrows in your hand and strike the ground. So Joash takes the arrows in his hand. He strikes the ground three times and stops. So Elisha gets angry with him, rebukes him, and said, if you had kept striking, then God would have given you complete victory over Syria. But because you stopped, he'll only strike, he struck the ground three times with the arrows, he'll only strike Syria three times. <laughs> What's the moral of that story? Don't stop. You're given a charge from God, press on, keep going, you know. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Promise, promise, promise. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I love that promise. Amen. Paul is a man under obligation. He lives like a man under obligation. He thinks like a man under obligation. He prays like a man under obligation. And with that sense of obligation comes the necessity of submitting himself fully to the will of God. Listen, that is the only place, the only place where you're going to find true peace, true security, true safety, we're at a time right now where people everywhere you turn are fearful, fearful, fearful. Fear, and you got a, a bunch of fear mongers who are trying to hype up the fear. The only place where you're going to have true safety is in the middle of God's revealed will for you. The only place you're going to have true security. The only place where there's true peace and joy. There's no security otherwise. Right? Because otherwise, God is against you. What are some examples, then, for how we should not respond? We can think of ways, right? What are some examples, then, of how not to respond? One, don't respond like a practical or functional atheist. Don't let yourself, don't catch yourself responding in that way. 
One, to, to respond like a practical or a functional atheist is to not concern yourself at all with the will or the direction of God. To live as though you weren't submitted to his will, as though he didn't exist. Listen, Christians, professing Christians do that all the time. Right? How many? How many? Wake up on a Sunday morning. Oh, I'm supposed to go to church today. They go to church, they leave church, and then that's it until the next time the alarm goes off on a Sunday morning. They live like functional or practical atheists. No practical or observable evidence that that person believes at all that God is sovereign over his circumstances or over all things whatsoever that come to pass. He simply lives his life, may go to church on the Lord's day, but no submission to his lordship. Freely does what he wants, lives under no restraints, doesn't see God at work through his circumstances, right? Sees chance as it were, or fate. May even blame God for poor circumstances. Certainly won't thank God for good ones. He is a practical antinomian, a lawless one, practical or a functional atheist. But secondly, there may be a practical or a functional atheist that, that may believe, say they believe, they say they believe there is a God, but that you don't believe that he is good. So you worry and you gripe and you complain and you're anxious. You take matters into your own hands like Eve. Somehow God is an ogre who withholds something good from you. Or like Saul, you, you don't act as though God hears you. Listen, when you don't act, when you don't believe that God hears you, what better are you than all those prophets of Baal that danced around the altar that Elijah made, cutting themselves? Why? Because their God can't hear them. And if you don't believe that God hears you, then what better are you than they? And Elijah mocked them, right? Where's your God? Is he on a journey? Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's in the restroom. <laughs> it's shameful, isn't it? It's shameful for God's people not to have that kind of confidence in God who redeemed their wretched soul. Blood bought by the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we live our lives as practical atheists. It's shameful. Shameful. Secondly, you... you you could respond like a practical or functional charismatic. I know, I know that God has a perfect plan for my life, but if I'm not careful, I can miss it. He makes it mysterious. He shrouds it from view so that I have to work really hard and build up a bunch of faith so that I can find it. I'll, I'll look, if I look hard enough, if I interpret all the tea leaves rightly, or if I interpret all the star charts or the palms rightly, I think I can figure it out. If I turn over every rock, I can find it. And if I happen to miss it, I'm, it I'm, could be re in real trouble. It's like an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> when the eggs are really hidden, <laughs> really hard to find, it's like reading tea leaves. This happened, or that happened, and so that must mean his will revealed to me through feelings, through inferences, leanings, impressions, oftentimes not even my own, but other people <laughs> come to me with the same feelings, or inferences, or leanings, or impressions, or an audible word from God. So I will seek those things then rather than live according to the revealed will of God. And if I want anything at all, I've just got to convince him well enough to give it to me. I put enough faith, he'll give it to me. And I can do that with extra faith. I just need to be extra convincing. Maybe if I have a little, spread a little oil on it, you know. <laughs> Fourth, yeah. virgin olive oil. So. <laughs> Fourth, uh, you could respond like a practical or functional hypocrite. A practical or functional hypocrite. You act in selfish, self-willed ways, and then you cover up the whole affair in a cloak of religiosity. I prayed about it. I prayed about it. And I prayed really hard. And I feel led. I feel led by the Spirit. God has opened a door. He's lined everything up 
for me. You, you see what you're doing. You're a functional hypocrite. You have been self-willed, and now you wrap your self-willed decision in a cloak of religion. I got counsel, which means that you shopped for counsel until you got the counsel that you could agree with, or you avoided counsel altogether. You know, it's like, we have um, tested, proven, godly brothers and sisters here. Philippians chapter 3, brothers and sisters, those who are notable among us. And yet you've made a decision, and when I say, well, who'd you talk to about that? You went to your third cousin, twice removed, lives in Wisconsin, who is a Buddhist, and got counsel, right? <laughs> and then you said you got counsel. Or well, I talked to Pastor Mark about it when I didn't tell you to do, the, <laughs> to do that thing. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> Right? I'd, be, I'd be so much better able to serve the Lord if I were there. When serving the Lord is not, no part of your motivation for going there. Right? It's, you're a functional hypocrite. Five, you could respond like a practical or a functional antinomian. You don't want God's revealed will. So like Jonah, you get on a boat. You deny that it's God's will. And so you divorce because God would want me to be happy. You act first and then expect that God will bless you in your presumptuous action. You're testing the Lord. A functional antinomian, law, a lawless one. You're not going to his revealed will. You're lawless. You avoid those means that God actually appoints to help you. And so you seek no counsel, no help. You respond fatalistically like Eli. Let God do whatever seems right to him. Brothers and sisters, we must live submitted to the will and direction of God as Paul was. You and I, as Paul is, we are under obligation. Slaves of Jesus Christ, we are not our own. We must submit to him, and that, brothers and sisters, is for our great and lasting good. Eventually, Paul's prayer was answered, <laughs> was fulfilled, not in the way that Paul expected Paul was carried to Rome as a prisoner and in the just <laughs> the infinite grace of God, right? How good is our God? Paul's taken off to Rome as a prisoner. He's under house arrest for two years, able to have his own place where he's able to freely preach the gospel in Rome. What does Paul do? Paul preaches the gospel in Rome for two years and to the church at Philippi, Paul says that even those, there are even those among Caesar's household who are saved. Turned out all of this. No doubt, Paul didn't see it. He couldn't see how it would all turn out. We don't know. God knows. And our God is good and faithful. And he will work all things after the counsel of his own will for our good. All of this turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, even Paul's chains. And Paul came to see God's wisdom, God's goodness, God's love in it all. Let's trust the Lord, you and I. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his sovereign direction and let us fully submit ourselves to him. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we see your goodness and your kindness and your mercy and your grace at work in us and through us. And help us, Lord, uh, by your spirit to submit ourselves to your will. Renew our minds. Lord, transform us by the renewing of our minds according to your revealed will so that we may know to discern, to prove, to examine, to test what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Help us, Lord, to walk wisely, walk circumspectly. Help us to trust you above all. Help us to, to live as we ought, not as functional atheists or functional charismaniacs or as functional um, agnostics. Or Lord, help us to believe upon you in your word and guide us and direct us as we know you are so kind to do. And may we pray to you in faith. May we plan with great fervency and zeal for your cause, your work. 
And may you be glorified. May your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, be exalted. And all these things we pray in his name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.